So if you've been following my journey learning about electronics repair over the last couple of years, you've probably seen me use this digital microscope. Got it a couple of years ago now. It's a 7-inch display model made by a company called Tom Love. And there's numerous similar looking products from a wide range of companies that you can find on places like Amazon for anywhere between about 100 and 200 US dollars. For me, a microscope is an absolutely essential tool when you're dealing with fine pitch SMD components. Sure, you could try using a magnifying glass, and I have in the past, but I'm getting way too old, and I need some more serious visual aid to do this stuff. And as an added bonus, microscopes like this are able to take photos and video, which means I can create and share these clips on YouTube that would otherwise be very difficult to record. After using it a few times while soldering, there was really no going back for me. Although this microscope was a real game changer, it and all similar models have one very glaring fault. The base and stand can really only be used with small PCBs. Fine for an expansion card, like a smaller video card or something, but if you try to use it with something larger, like a motherboard, you're going to be limited to working around the edges of the board only. And that's because you've only got about 6 centimeters or 2.5 inches between the optics and the stand. I've had a few people comment in the past that they've made modifications to this type of microscope to eliminate the base and stand, and just to install the top portion on an articulating arm. I'd been meaning to look more into this, but never got around to it. So it looks like Tom Love took notice that I used their microscope in many of my videos, and reached out to see if I'd be interested in trying out their new microscope, the DM501 Pro. And as you can probably guess, this new microscope is a completely new design that does away with that annoying stand and includes a desk-mounted arm that should provide a lot more flexibility when working on larger PCBs. In addition to this, it should also have some improved optics, better screen, and other benefits over my old microscope. Alright, so let's open up this box here and see what's included. First, we've got the desk-mounted adjustable arm, which has a really nice high-quality look and feel to it. I'll talk more about this in a bit. Next is the clamping gooseneck LED lights. They've got a wired remote attached to them for power and brightness, and a USB-A connector on the other end for powering them up. Lights are much heftier than what was attached to my old microscope, and the clamp feels pretty strong. Shouldn't have any issues attaching this even to thicker desks. Inside the bag of cables here, we can see the included 64GB micro SD card, which is great, as well as a USB-A to USB-C charging cable, and an HDMI cable for hooking it up to an external TV or monitor. Another nice bonus they include is this large silicone solder mat. So since there's no base to put your project on, I'd say it was thoughtful to include something to protect your work surface. It's also got some embedded magnets in it to help keep your small components in place, which is definitely handy. And now for the box within the box, the microscope itself and a small remote control is in here, as well as the manual for the microscope, which is actually pretty well written, although somewhat concise. But yeah, good diagrams and easy to follow installation instructions. The remote is pretty basic and sort of resembles an Apple TV remote. Although there are some buttons on the screen that can be used, the remote is actually pretty important and I'll get more into that later. And now for the most important piece, the large 10.1 inch IPS display with the attached optics. I knew the microscope and screen would be a few inches larger than my old one, but it looks and feels a lot more substantial, that's for sure. I'll get a better side-by-side -side view soon, but yeah, big difference between these two. All of the ports and the SD card slot are protected under a rubber flap on the back of the unit. There's an HDMI output here for an external monitor, a USB-C port for power input and for connecting it to a PC if you ever wanted to. There's also a USB-A port for power output, which is intended to provide power to the base lights. That way you don't need a power splitter or two separate chargers, which is nice. And speaking of power, there is a 2000 milliamp hour battery built into the unit, which will apparently power the microscope for several hours. The optics on this thing should be a pretty good step up from my old scope. It has a manual focus that you can adjust by twisting the top portion, and it also includes a polarizer that can be enabled and disabled by twisting the bottom part of the scope, and I'll talk more about that feature shortly. The adjustable arm attaches very easily to your work surface with the clamp, and it has a really high quality feel to it. I was actually surprised to see just how stiff it is. It takes considerable effort to move it in any direction, which is not a bad thing. When you're dealing with something as sensitive as a microscope, you want it held as securely as possible. Likewise, the gooseneck LED lights also have a good feel to them, and they stay in the position they're put. This was actually an issue I had with my old scope. The lights were not stiff enough, and they would constantly bounce back after positioning them, which was quite annoying. 
The screen attaches to the arm using a spring-loaded clamp, and it's got a ball joint on the back of it. You just unscrew the socket, and it snaps right on. Up to this point, everything felt very secure, but the spring-loaded clamp felt a little bit like an afterthought to me, and it doesn't really make the best contact with the screen. It is held on well enough, but the protruding part at the back means that the clamp can only grab onto the top half of the screen. You can see that the rubber bits on the top of the clamp don't even make contact with it at all. At first I thought I must be doing something wrong, but nope, even the manual shows it attached in this way. A little bit kludgy given how solid everything else feels, but not really a big deal. I was a bit worried that the clamp would interfere with the ports on the back, but they're all just fine. Even the HDMI port can still be used with the included cable. It has a 90 degree end on it, so it clears the ball joint. The only problem I had was accessing the micro SD card with the clamp attached. It's a real pain to get it out by hand, and I just wound up using some tweezers whenever I needed to get it out. I threw a Matrox Millennium graphics card under the microscope and powered it up. I was immediately impressed by the image quality. There's just really no comparison between this and my old scope. So much more clear and detailed, and the lighting is just way better. The larger screen really helps too, that's for sure. But I hadn't been using it for more than a few seconds when I realized there would be a very glaring problem here. Look at all of that wobble and shakiness. Every single movement of the card or a touch of the desk, and it just translated right onto the scope. I'm hoping nobody watching this is prone to getting motion sick, but yeah, even adjusting the focus knob or pressing a button on it causes it to wobble pretty badly. But this is hardly the fault of the microscope or the stand. I have this thing attached to a very flimsy and lightweight IKEA desk, so this microscope really needs a solid work surface, or even better, it should be mounted on something other than what your project will be sitting on. Ideally, I'd like to get this thing attached to the wall somehow, but for now, I just put a wooden chair behind my desk, and I made sure that it's not touching the desk at all, and that pretty much solved the problem for me, and I'm able to move the card around just fine now. I do still get a little bit of wobble when I'm adjusting the focus, but that's okay and I can live with that. Like I said earlier too, the remote control is a great addition because it means you don't need to touch the buttons on the screen, and you can avoid some shakiness that way too. One feature I was eager to try out on this microscope was the polarizer. So this image here is with the polarizer disabled. As you can see, there's a lot of glare, and it's really difficult to read the component values. This is the kind of image I had come to expect with my old microscope. This next image is of the same three resistor arrays, but with the polarizer enabled. Look at that difference, it's pretty incredible. The glare is almost completely gone, and the component values are very easy to read now. All right, so I'm pretty impressed by the DM501 Pro so far. But it's time to put this thing to practical use and see what it can do for an actual repair job. So what are we going to fix with this thing today? I think it only makes sense to give it a try on a full-size ATX motherboard. So in front of me here is a Gigabyte GA7IXE. This is an AMD Slot A motherboard based on AMD's own Iron Gate chipset. So Slot A boards like this one are somewhat rare nowadays, and they're made for the original cartridge-based Athlon CPUs, as opposed to the more common Socket 462 varieties that came out later on. This board came with a 700 MHz AMD Athlon CPU, and this particular model is the 180 nanometer Pluto variety. It's got 512 kilobytes of L2 cache on the cartridge, but like the Pentium 2s and early Pentium 3s, this model's cache runs at only half the CPU frequency, so 350 megahertz in this case. I got this board in an as-is bundle on eBay a few years back, and I did test it briefly back then, but it completely refused to post, and I just threw it into the broken pile for a look at in the future. And well, the future is now. Better late than never, I suppose. The board powers up and the fans spin, but it really doesn't show much life beyond this. I'd sometimes get a C0 postcode, which would normally mean something on an award-based system, but since this thing is AMI, that really makes no sense at all and doesn't give me any useful clues. I was going to give the board a good cleaning and then inspect it for damage, but it really didn't take me long to find a very serious problem, namely this huge deep gouge out of the PCB on the back of the board. I don't think I really need a multimeter to tell me that a bunch of traces are severed here, and not just severed, but literally scraped right off the board. So I can see seven of them here that connect between the CPU slot and the north bridge. Obviously some very critical traces, I'd say. My main concern here is that the gouge looks really deep. It's not a superficial scratch or cut, and I can only hope that nothing is damaged beyond the surface layer of the PCB. Hopefully it's just a ground plane or something underneath there. 
Now because of the wide gouge here and the very thin traces, I don't think I'm going to try to do bare wire bridging. All of these traces have easily accessible vias on either side of the cut, so probably makes more sense to just do some bodge wiring here instead. It won't really look that pretty, but at least it'll remain hidden under the board, and I think there's a pretty decent chance I can get this thing going again. So the first thing I'm going to do here is try to get the solder mask out of the vias, and I'm just gently drilling them out with a sharp poker tool here. No idea what the proper name for that tool is. Turned out to be a lot more annoying than I thought it would be, but with some patience I got most of it out. Next I started gently scraping off the solder mask around the vias on either side of the damage. I needed to expose as much copper as possible without damaging it so that the solder will have something to stick to. The copper is pretty shiny so the microscope makes it easy to see when you've got enough off. So yeah, that's seven vias on each side and I think that looks pretty good. For bodge wire I'm going to be using some 30 gauge wire wrap. So this stuff's really cheap and to be honest I don't like it for this purpose. The insulation on this is way too thick and it doesn't react well to heat as you'll see in a second. To get this attached I put a 90 degree bend in the end of the wire and I just insert it slightly into the via so that I can get some better contact. Obviously I've applied some flux here and I've just got a tiny amount of solder on my iron tip and a quick touch does the trick. And now for the other end near the north bridge. Yep, yeah, looks good. But yeah, that insulation melts like nothing. Thankfully, it can be reshaped to some degree with the tweezers. The next five wires went without issue, but I did struggle a bit with the sixth one, and I managed to bridge the last two vias together. Oops. On this part of the board, they are very close together, so it's a bit trickier. Here, I'm just reflowing the joint and pushing the wire over a little bit to make some more space, and then I was able to get the bridge all cleaned up with some copper wick and some additional flux. And thankfully that was enough to allow me to connect the final wire at the top without issue. I found it tricky to get the right length of wire ahead of time, so I would solder the top joint, position the wire, and then I could more easily figure out exactly how long it needed to be. Things were getting pretty crowded at the bottom when I got to the final wire, but it went on without issue, and all seven broken traces have been fixed. And finally I'm just getting everything cleaned up with some isopropyl alcohol, and then I'll give it a final inspection. So there it is. I will be the first to admit that is a very clunky looking bodge job. <laughs> but the joints are all good and functionally it should work. Thankfully older boards like this one should be fine with a wire based bodge like this. But I'd imagine that it may not fly with more modern high frequency components and you could get some signal issues as a result. But that's one of the reasons I like working on older gear. Much more forgiving with things like this. I definitely do need to get some new wire for doing repairs like this though. The insulation is just too thick relative to the wire size, and as you saw it melts way too easily. Maybe some silicone based wire wrap or enamel magnet wire maybe. Let me know what you'd suggest in the comments below. To protect the repair and make sure nothing snags a wire or anything like that, I stuck a piece of captain tape on it. It had the unexpected benefit of filtering out the purple color and actually making it blend in really well with the back of the board. That was kind of surprising. But using some solder mask, epoxy, or even hot glue on the joints could be another good way to protect the repair. But for now, I think this should be fine. Now for the moment of truth, it's time to get this thing back on the test bench and see if it actually posts. So this was definitely the most obvious problem with the board, but was it the only problem? Let's find out. And yes indeed, it's alive. Now obviously I'll have to do some more thorough stability testing on this thing, but that is looking good so far. The caps look okay on the board, and the VRM actually uses high quality Sanyo models, so that's pretty good, but being from the capacitor plague era, I can't really speak for the others, and it may benefit from a recap, but that's for another day. Alright, so there you have it, another retro motherboard lives on. So the Tom Love DM501 Pro is a great product all around, and it really helped me to make this repair possible. It's way better than my old microscope in pretty much every way. The adjustable arm is a real game changer, and finally I can work on larger projects without the stand getting in the way. But not only that, it's got greatly improved optics, beautiful 10 inch IPS screen, better lighting, and it records way better looking video footage. The only catch of course is that you absolutely need a solid work surface to mount it to, otherwise you're going to have a very shaky image with every tiny movement you make. Again, not a fault of the microscope, but definitely something you need to be aware of if you're considering this type of mounting system. At the time of recording this video, the DM501 Pro is on sale for $250 US dollars. You can find Tom Love's products on Amazon, and you can buy from them directly too. It does look like they have promotions and sales frequently, so be sure to keep an eye out for those if you're interested in buying one. 
If the Pro is a bit beyond your budget, Tom Love does have a similar model called the DM501S with a smaller 7 inch screen. So yeah, not cheap, but considering what other microscopes with stands are going for these days, this one has some very clear advantages and I do really believe it's worth paying a bit extra for. So that's it for today. Please don't forget to like and subscribe if you'd like to see some more content like this. And if you like my channel, please consider supporting me on Patreon. You can find a link to my Patreon page and other useful links in the description below. Thanks again.